In this video we'll be looking at a recently released game that dropped on almost all platforms earlier this month, a game called Guilt. But this isn't a new game, it was in fact a Google Stadia exclusive until the platform was shut down earlier this year due to, you know, no one really using it. Guilt was probably the most kid friendly horror game I've ever played, it's essentially Alan Wake, but way less scary. Despite that, the message for the game was pretty deep and meaningful, and carried a very important message within it in regard to bullying and depression, as well as dealing with loss. It had a good amount of puzzles, and was around 4-5 to five hours in length. The story did, however, become very confusing when it came to diving deeper into the game's lore, as you'll see later in the video. Now before we begin, please be aware that this video will contain spoilers for guilt. If you want to play the game for yourself and don't want to know the story, then I'm not sure why you're here, but you have been warned. Let's begin. 11 year old Sally Kaufman is posting missing persons flyers in her town, the small mining town of Bethelwood in Maine. The missing person in question is 7 year old Emily Kaufman, Sally's cousin who has been missing for a month. It appears that Emily, one day, literally just vanished. According to Sally, people lost hope and stopped looking for Emily after a few weeks. A few hours later, Sally is out of the town and up on the mountain. It's fairly late, so she decides to go home. She hops onto her bike and starts to ride down the mountain, but she is spotted by a group of bullies who chase her, and she ends up crashing her bike after colliding with a railing and falls down a hill. Her bike is damaged, so Sally needs to find a way back to the town and back home. She moves forward, still hiding from the bullies, and spots a sign for a cable car, which used to connect Bethelwood to a factory in the mountains which was itself run by Tom Mining Solutions, and which provided the town the vast majority of its jobs. Approaching the ticket booth, she speaks to the attendant, and the old man says although the cable car is now closed, he will let her descend the mountain but that she needs a ticket in order to do so. A nearby ticket machine already has a rough looking ticket which looks like it's made out of dirt sticking out of the slot so Sally takes it, pleased that she'll receive a free ride on the cable car. Result. But when she returns to the cable car, Sally finds the old man is gone. He's disappeared. Nonetheless, Sally enters the cable car and it descends down the mountain, but on its journey, the cable car momentarily stops and passes through a strange looking magnetic field. Sally arrives at the bottom. It's strange as the cable car breaks down and all the light at the cable car station shut off too. Not to worry though, as Sally finds a conveniently placed flashlight on the ground. Continuing down a path and climbing a fence, Sally arrives in the town, but it's different to how she remembers. It's seemingly abandoned, and not only that, it's partially destroyed too, as if it was hit by an earthquake. Coming to a school, Sally spots Emily. She's alive and is inside the school, but she seems scared, holding her teddy bear closely. Sally is confused to think that her cousin has been hiding at school the entire time, and then Emily runs off. The doors to the school are locked, naturally, so Sally imagines there will probably be a key in the school janitor's office. She goes into the office and the key is indeed there, but Sally is interrupted by something. It's not the janitor, but it's something else entirely, an entity called a stranger, which appears to be searching for something or someone. Sally manages to avoid more of them in the courtyard and gains entry to the school. In search of Emily, Sally finds strange eye entities named observers blocking a door that she needs to get through. So she heads to the different classrooms and offices in order to try and find a way through. She finds more observers in the classrooms, and after evading more strangers, eventually Sally finds a way into Emily's classroom. Sally was hoping to find either her, or even clues as to her whereabouts, but there's no trace of Emily there. The board, however, has abusive messages written on it. More investigation and sneaking leads Sally through the biology labs and into a vent where she stumbles upon a room where Emily has obviously been staying. She finds her old flashlight, a powerful upgrade to the one she found at the cable car station. It was a flashlight that she gifted to Emily a long time ago. The flashlight in question allows Sally to shine a more powerful concentrated beam at certain objects. She discovers that she can use it to defeat the strangers, and she also uses it to blast away the eye entities blocking the double doors to the second floor stairs. Of course, the stairs are blocked off, so Sally now has to find another way up to the second floor to where she saw Emily. Heading for the school cafeteria, Sally opens the doors, but is almost caught by a fire beast. She sneaks through the cafeteria and heads outside in the hope that she'll be able to find some help. She spots a fire truck and a ladder which could reach the second floor. Exiting the school gates, Sally is approached by the strange old man from the cable car ticket booth. She asks the man who he is, and he tells Sally that she must find Emily, and that she is the key to ending this nightmare. Then, the man disappears as fast as he appeared. 
No one else seems to be around at all in the town, only more strangers, and now different types of strangers, ones that resemble birds and who can teleport. Sally eventually reaches the fire truck after evading more strangers, but the fire truck needs a battery as it appears that something took it to the nearby arcade. Sally gets there and there are more strangers inside. She heads to the second floor of the arcade, but it's clear that she's being stalked by something. But nonetheless, she finds the battery she needs. The spider-like entity that has been stalking Sally makes an appearance. It uses a bright light on its face as a searchlight in order to try and spot her, but after a dangerous game of cat and mouse, Sally makes it out of the arcade and back out onto the street. With her battery, Sally uses it on the fire truck. Sally then gains access to the second floor of the school, but she is still being stalked. In the classroom, Sally is kind of spooked to find a doll that strangely looks exactly like her. Moving through the second floor, which looks very different to the school she remembers, Sally once again sees Emily. She finds yet another area where Emily appears to have been staying and sleeping. Another classroom contains walls covered in missing persons posters, but with the faces scrubbed out along with a depiction of the fire monster Sally encountered earlier on. But a little while later, Sally makes it to the landing by the staircase. Sally pushes forward and finds Emily's teddy bear. The door though is locked again, so naturally Sally has to find the key. Making her way around the second floor and avoiding hazards, Sally completes a strange light puzzle and obtains the key for room 202. Inside room 202 though, she sees Emily has left the building and it gets worse as she's actively being pursued by the spider entity from the arcade. Sally needs to help her. As she is banging on the window though, the fire beast appears, smashing through the floor, leading to a tense face-off in the science labs. Given its nature, its elemental weakness is good old H2O, and Sally uses it to stun the beast into revealing a weak spot which she blasts with a powerful flashlight. The beast is eventually defeated and retreats. Remembering that Emily is in danger, Sally leaves that building and heads to the school's auditorium. Entering the auditorium building, Sally hears Emily screaming, and after gaining entry into the actual theatre with a key, Sally sees Emily who has been caught by the spider entity and is being forced to watch something on the screen. It appears to show Emily having been bullied, and the cruel entity is forcing her to relive the bullying. Sally turns off each of the projectors that the creature is using, and it leads to the creature being electrocuted and killed after the machine behind it explodes. Emily is released, but she screams at Sally to leave her alone, and once again, in totally non-predictable fashion, she runs off, telling Sally not to follow her. Then, Sally has no choice but to run after Emily, as loads of angry and scary dolls that resemble Sally bash the doors to the theatre open, giving chase. Sally manages to give them all the slip by escaping the auditorium. She is now in the arts centre, which she needs to pass through. Again, she remarks that the centre seems very different than she remembers. Whilst there, she finds a special kind of door, which is missing a piece. A yellow canary, which she sees suspended in the air. She's not alone during her time in the art centre, as she's now being hunted and has to avoid the creepy dolls. She finds a small fire extinguisher, which not only helps her extinguish various fires and flaming eye entities in the school, but also helps her freeze the creepy dolls. Despite the opposition trying to stop her from reaching her goal, Sally manages to get hold of the canary and exits the art centre. Sally speaks with Emily once again. Emily! Are you okay? How did you get up there? Don't pretend like you care! After what you did to me? You're just another monster! What are you talking about? Oh no! Emily, run! Run! Hide in the gym! Go to the roof, you hear me? Quick, I'll meet you there! What's happening? Why did she call me a monster? I've got to hurry. So the gym is the next stop. Needing to get to the roof, Sally finds that a door she needs to get through in order to do so is locked, and she needs three keys in order to open it. She enters into the gym's basketball court, which bizarrely seems to be some sort of prison now, with a large ladder leading to the roof, but that can only be accessed from the floor below. Sally spots security monitors, all featuring the Tom logo on the screen. In pursuit of one of the keys, Sally ends up in a tunnel underneath the gym and enters into a very large basement area. It's part of the old Tom mine. She doesn't have peace and quiet for very long though, as the fire beast is around. Anyway, Sally finds the three keys that she needs in order to get through the large door and unlocks it. It leads to the underground mining area. Before she can get to the ladder though, the fire beast swings by and says hello, and once again the two fight one another. Sally again uses water to defeat the monstrosity and climbs the ladder up to the roof. Emily is sat in relative safety, away from pursuing dolls, and she's with the old man. But 
this is what you wanted. Not her. She was mean to me like the others. But I... I... Emily, I found you. Are you okay? Oh, you're not hurt, are you? Leave me. W why are you saying this? You left me. I was new at school. Everyone was picking on me. And you. You're my cousin. And you turned your back on me. That's not true. You're worse than them. You made me think we were friends. Well, let's go home. And we can home? Look around, Sally. Does it look like home to you? We're trapped here. There's nothing we can do. It won't let us. It just won't. You were supposed to help her. What? Why me? I've tried. I've tried so hard. No one's trying to help me. It will be okay. Perhaps we can still do something. I know where they'll take her. Down to the mine, so we can't reach her. I can't go there. But I can help you get in. There's still a chance for you to make things right, Sally. And then what? She's right. The town is doomed. We're doomed. Come, Sally. You need to see something. What is that? Is that... Bethelwood? But if that's... Then where am I? What is this place? Emily was right. This isn't your home. It's somewhere else entirely. But there's still hope. The cable car will take you away from this place for good. But you need to find your cousin first. I don't understand. How do you know all this? Do you know Emily? What exactly are you? I'm a friend. I've been helping Emily, way before you arrived. And now I need your help to bring her back home. You have to rescue Emily from the mine. I'll take care of the rest. Okay. I'll, I'll do it. Meet me at the school entrance. Take your time and be prepared. You won't be able to come back from the mine until you find Emily. Is that clear? Yes. Good. I'll be waiting. Sally heads to the entrance of the school and speaks with the old man again. He tells her that he'd go with her to the mine, but that he cannot as he is not strong anymore. He says he needs all of his strength to be able to bring them back. He tells Sally the plan of action, that when he brings them back, they need to run to the cable car. Not only that, Sally must give her cable car ticket to Emily, otherwise the cable car will not run. The old man then opens up a green portal and then disappears. Sally walks into the portal and out of the school into an even more twisted underground version of the town. Of course, there are hostile entities everywhere, but Sally evades them. But then she comes up against the tall grotesque creature that took Emily. It takes her flashlight and crushes it, leaving Sally without her much needed light source. A little further on, Sally spots Emily. Making her way round to her, Sally speaks with her. Please, help me. Of course I will. Oh no. Run, Emily, run! The two then make a mad dash trying to evade the creature. They manage to evade it and make it back to the portal which takes them to the cable car. Okay, so the point of the game has arrived where three possible outcomes or endings can occur. The old man sits at the cable car station and he says that only one of them can go back via the cable car as they only have one ticket. In the first ending, Sally can follow the old man's prior instructions and due to her guilt in not defending her cousin, she gives the ticket to Emily, pushing her onto the cable car and staying there in that strange dark world. As Emily leaves, the entire world along with the old man and Sally fade away, and as a result, Sally is now missing back in the real world. In the second ending, Sally can selfishly use the ticket for herself, choosing to leave Emily there in the dark world. 
She tearfully apologizes to Emily, saying that after she went missing, everyone blamed her and hated her. She says that she wanted to find her so that people would forgive her. She then leaves. Sally then goes back to placing missing posters in the town. And the third and final ending requires a little more preparation. In the game, Sally would come across strange stone people known as inhabitants. These were former workers at Tom. They have an interesting story, but we'll look at them shortly. Anyway, freeing all 10 of these inhabitants would provide Sally with one scrap towards a full cable car ticket. Upon arriving with Emily at the cable car station, the old man spots the ticket fragments and he uses them to make one full ticket. With one ticket each, Sally and Emily are able to leave the dark world and return to their real town, whilst the old man holding Sally's teddy bear simply fades away. The game then ends. Alright, so that's the basic explanation of the plot, but we still have a bit to explore here before we can fully understand what happened and exactly why Sally and Emily ended up in a strange, darker version of their own town. The game dropped story breadcrumbs throughout in the form of diary entries, however the documents in regards to the miners were terrible for trying to build a picture of what happened and when because there were no dates attached to the documents, so a little bit of a deep dive into the documents was necessary, but here we go. The coal mine itself was the pride of Bethelwood, so much so that the town's mascot was a yellow canary. The canaries were used in the mines to detect gas leaks which would of course protect the employees from danger and from harm. The mine was one day acquired by a large corporation known as the Tom Mining Solutions, which as a result of its resources managed to provide lots of jobs for the townsfolk in its factory. Bethelwood, due to this, prospered. At some point in time though, Tom became aware of the native's legend of the mountain. One of the darkest stories was that the mountain was quite literally hungry, that it feeds upon fear. So the mountain created a carnival of fears made to trap broken people there and torment them with reminders of their anguish. The broken person would then become a part of the mountain and their life essence would be gradually extracted from them and that itself would take the form of a red stone. The person would then very slowly begin to turn to stone themselves. The red stone itself was described as almost like a bloodstone which glowed. It was considered to have a devilish vibe, so it was definitely evil. Tom and the miners considered it as a tainted present from ancient and forgotten gods, and they would call it red quartz as a way to disguise it as just a valuable mineral rather than the otherworldly artifact that it actually was. The legend of the mountain was a curse. Tom wanted to look for secrets of the mountain and sent the miners down to dig, not for coal, but in order to find the red quartz rocks. Slowly but surely, the miners began to breathe the darkness in the mountain and slowly lost themselves. They became empty and depressed. Workers expressed their hatred for Tom as a company along with their policies and their psychological tests. This miner mentions that he's sitting on his couch and can hear monsters outside clawing at the windows. The man is holding a strange piece of a ticket and mentions a man with green eyes. Essentially, in the 1930s, three miners went missing whilst working at the mines, all of them complaining of depression and that they hated the company, the mine and life itself. So in order to run away from the disappearance of the miners, Tom caused an accident at the mine, claiming more lives, and from what I can tell from the information in the documents at least, it caused a landslide which destroyed the entire town. The town of Bethelwood was evacuated, and it was here that Tom outlined what would happen next. When it came to the Tom Corporation, well, they weren't going to give up on the secrets of the mountain that easily. They essentially rebuilt the entire town of Bethelwood and moved it to the other side of the valley, and then moved all the residents to the new town. The residents effectively got new houses, so most of the town were elated and celebrating. The townsfolk settled in the new town, and then Tom reopened the mine as if nothing had happened, and continued looking for the red quartz. On the side note, the cable car that Sally took down was actually the old cable car as you can see the new cable car station in the distance. That cable car station would have probably taken Sally to the new town. It didn't take long for things to go wrong again. The miners were again experiencing depression due to what they were doing down in the mine. Tom, again, wanted to avoid lawsuits, so they hired psychiatrists to the point where Tom had a large number of people working in their healthcare department, as that many miners were being affected by the curse that resided upon the mountain. Eventually, with the situation becoming ever more out of hand again, Tom turned to a prominent psychiatrist who was coming to the end of a very long and successful career in treating workers suffering from mining-related trauma. Tom offered the psychiatrist a huge salary to work exclusively for them at the coal mine in Bethelwood. His idea was that he could potentially retire there in the town. When he got there, it was much, much worse than he had anticipated. At first, he was flabbergasted by the amount of people working in the mine's health department, 12 people. 
but the psychiatrist would later convey his thoughts that 12 staff wasn't nearly enough to deal with what was happening. He discovered quickly what was happening to the miners. They were broken men, and their minds were being shattered, and they became severely depressed. One miner spoke about finding himself in what seemed to be a completely different place, that he can see monsters running around. He mentions that he's trapped in a hellish, bizarre nightmare, and there is ash everywhere. He too speaks about having a piece of ticket on him. Another miner spoke of having itchy skin. Their skin was burning, red, and falling off. He was seeing the nurses, but left and tried to find the nurses again later on, but they were nowhere to be found, and the place was completely deserted. The man then mentions monsters, along with seeing and being accompanied by his old dog, Cooper. But the bizarrely Cooper, who had strange glowing green eyes, died when the man was seven years old. Then the man would eventually turn into this. Another worker, the prominent psychiatrist, would also go missing, and another, and another. One miner even suggested how Tom was able to afford to rebuild the entire town, and the miners suspected that the government may even be involved due to the possibilities that the stones could reward them with. Another of the miners in particular knew exactly what was going on. At first he wanted to know more about what they'd found, but then he became more and more unsettled by it when he discovered the source of the red quartz, which was of course the essence of inhabitants of the town, lost and now belonging to the mountain. He tried to talk to his colleagues and superiors about what was happening, but no one would listen to him or take him seriously. It all came to a head one day when this mining employee was considered to be going mad because of his age, so the Tom Corporation simply fired him. The man, desperate not only to get through to people, but to prevent this getting worse, started a fire in the mine. This fire claimed the lives of seven workers. The man stated that it was a small price to pay. All of the miners that went missing ended up in a Silent Hill-esque parallel dimension a version of the town moulded by the psyche, and the fears and torment of everyone who ended up there. One miner describes the mine as a flytrap, ensnaring people inside it one by one, transforming the surroundings as a result of their own perception. It's not really clear as to what the exact moment is when a person finds themselves suddenly inside this alternative world, but it seems that underneath the statue in the school's yard there's an object that may be the beating heart of the mountain and its curse. These documents, while serving a purpose in telling us what the miners were experiencing, what they went through and their transformation into the inhabitants, didn't do a very good job in telling the player when all of this happened. But anyway, what we were able to get from the documents was that the miners were working on obtaining red quartz, became affected by the curse of the mountain, became depressed and ended up finding themselves inside a parallel twisted world. All, if not most of the miners, reported seeing a ghostly type of person sporting green glowing eyes, which tended to resemble a loved one, who all gave them advice on how to escape that place. But of course none of them did as they all turned to stone, being known as inhabitants, and they would all have on them a piece of ticket which, if Sally would free them all using the red quartz stones, would help her to escape with Emily at the end of the game. Alright, that's it for this hella confusing section, I'm going to gladly move on. Thankfully, Emily's documents that she left around the school were a lot easier to digest. When Emily was little, she had a happy life, but as far as I can tell from this picture, Emily used to live in Bethelwood, but her family moved somewhere else. Emily had a close friendship with her cousin Sally. The two would have sleepovers, and Sally would gift Emily with her favourite flashlight in order to cheer her up, as Emily was sad to move away from her cousin. Emily had a great relationship in particular with her grandpa, who used to tell her lots of stories about his life. Emily used to go to her grandpa's house all the time until he got sick and he had to move in with Emily's parents so they could look after him. Eventually, Emily's grandpa would be admitted to hospital as he was dying. She heard her parents arguing that they have no reason to live where they do anymore given that her grandpa would soon pass away. So, Emily and her parents moved back to Bethelwood. Then Emily would go for a first date at Backman School. It was a bad experience for her. She has no friends there, Sally is in a different class to her and Emily's alone most of the time. A teacher in her class made her say her name in front of everyone, and then everyone would stare at her. Nonetheless, she is hopeful of making new friends. But then the bullying started. Emily even lost the ability to be able to smile, and would even practice in the mirror, but it wouldn't work as she'd just end up crying. Emily would venture to the second floor, but it scared her, as all the big older kids were there. At school, she would see Sally with her friends and would try to follow her, but it seemed like Sally was avoiding her. All the while, all the other kids in school would laugh at Emily and constantly stare at her. She thought that everyone in the school hated her. Her mother even kept Emily at home on at least one occasion due to her being too upset to go to school. The bullying had turned physical, with one of the kids in the gym class kicking her when she was on the floor. But it all came to a head when Sally had agreed to walk home with Emily. They saw each other and Sally smiled, but then one of Sally's friends called her over. 
Sally's friends then started calling Emily names and her friends left, but Sally went with them. Emily tried to follow her, but Sally pushed Emily away and told her to get lost, prompting her friends to laugh and for Emily to burst into tears. Emily thought that she should just get lost and this leads to how Emily ended up inside this alternate dimension and how she went missing. She instantly found herself in the school. She soon encountered the monsters that the miners referred to in their diaries. She mentions that she just thinks something and she ends up finding a diary with what she just thought written inside them. She mentions the old man. The old man's name according to the credits is a man named Caron. The old man with glowing green eyes. Ring a bell? The old man was obviously someone close to Emily. It was her grandpa, or rather the ghost of him, helping her, telling her that she isn't the one who deserves to be there. And before you dispute that in the comments, Tequila Works themselves confirmed that Caron is indeed the girl's grandfather. So Caron pretty much waited for Sally at the cable car station. He thought that Sally deserved to be there, as she was bullying her own cousin. Not directly, but by doing nothing at all to intervene. Emily's psyche moulded and shaped the world around her. The Observer was birthed out of the thought that everyone was watching her. Paranoia, an invisible enemy, was born out of Emily's thought that everyone was laughing at her. Blame was actually birthed out of Sally's psyche, not Emily's, due to her part in Emily's disappearance. It's also possible that the other entities were remnants of what the miners thought up as a result of their own psyches, such as one miner mentioning his fear of spiders, hence why the searchlight or projectionist entity somewhat resembled a spider. Finally, the game's name, Guilt, obviously just refers to Sally's guilt. But that's it for this video. Instead of signing off with the usual guff, I want to convey an important message. If you are being bullied or suffering from depression, then I'll put some helplines on the screen in order for you to seek and find help if you need it. Remember, there's always someone to talk to. But for now, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.